which seems to be the thing, collecting the mugs. So, hey, we've got a good number of attendees that are turning up, uh, which is nice to see. And if you've got any questions, feel free to pop them into the chat to us and we'll try and get to them um, uh, later on in the conversation. Um, but I'm going to hand over to Chris. Uh, do you want to, yeah. you, you kick us off. Well, Mr. Bright, we've got Let's two Chris's. Mr. Bright. <laughs> Mr. Bright. Okay, I'll be Mr. Bright today. Uh, okay, hi there, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second part of our Taking Church online series of webinars. Uh, so a thinking church we exist to help your church thrive and we hope that today this webinar does just that for you uh, As he's already said my name is Chris, Chris Bright, not Chris Surratt um, And I'll be the host for today. I'm obviously joined by uh, our founder, Thinking Church's founder, Lee Button. Lee, say hi Hi there, my name's Lee. Nice to see you all Great, and our guest for today is Chris Surratt uh, Chris, it's great to meet you uh, why don't you just introduce yourself and tell us a little about a little bit about what you do? First hurdle. Uh, uh, so we'll, we, um, we'll explain uh, that Chris had one or two connectivity issues joining into in today. Shall we? Uh, what we'll do is we'll um, we we we'll just play some like house music. And uh, wait for Sorry, guys. To, to Am do. I back now? Hey, yes. No, yes, you're back. You're back. Brilliant. Really hope, really Great. hoping this this works. If not, I'll switch over my phone. But I think you were asking me to introduce myself, so I will introduce myself. My name is Chris Rath, <laughs> and I do live in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, in the United States of America. And uh, I'm excited to be with you guys. Um, I am currently the small groups specialist for Lifeway Christian Resources, which is a, a Christian publisher based in Nashville, Tennessee. So we put out a lot of Bible studies, uh, resources for groups to use. Um, some of the big names that we publish, you guys may have heard of is Beth Moore, Tony Evans, Priscilla Shire, people like that. We put out their Bible studies. And so I, uh, that's, that's my day job. So I get to talk about small groups and discipleship quite a bit. I've written a couple books on it. Uh, one called Small Groups for the Rest of Us, another one called uh, Leading Small Groups that just came out in 2019. And uh, also I work with uh, the Unstuck group led by Tony Morgan, uh, which Lee uh, also works with. And I'm a consultant and I go around and uh, consult with churches and talk about strategic planning. And um, yeah, and I've been on staff at churches for about the last 24 years or so in different roles, uh, campus pastor, um, executive pastor, but uh, yeah, I've been in the full-time church ministry for a long time. Fantastic. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, brilliant. Okay, so don't forget, as Lee said earlier, there is a Q&A uh, section that if you have any questions at all, just use that and we will try and pick that up and do our best to answer it uh, for you. So it's, it's no surprise uh, that today we're going to be talking about small groups. Uh, especially, you know, we're in lockdown at the moment. So how do you run them during lockdown and what makes a successful group? I'm, uh, I'm excited to get started. Let's, uh, let's go. So um, the Unstuck Group, are, um, which is our sister organization that, uh, that Chris works with, uh, they've surveyed a lot of churches around the world and found that healthy churches are engaging 60% of their congregation in small groups. Chris, uh, you've seen many small groups in your time. Uh, what are the usual problems that people are coming to you about their small groups? Yeah, I see a lot of the same issues as I talk to churches and I do talk to a lot of churches and do a lot of small group leader training and some of the uh, same issues tend to come to the front. But one of the, the biggest ones is just consistency, that it's hard to get small groups to meet consistently it's hard to get consistent results from them. Um, you know, so a lot of uh, small group leaders, church leaders will give up on small groups or on their small group because they've had spotty attendance or, uh, you know, people, they have a hard time getting people to sign up or the group only meets, you know, every other week or once a month and then it gets less than that. And so being consistent with your small group is is a big deal. I think another uh, big issue that I see, especially with church leaders, is uh, knowing what the small groups are doing, having enough control over small groups, uh, because a lot of small groups will meet off campus, in homes, 
And so uh, a lot of the leaders are worried about what is going on with those groups? What are they studying? You know, is the theology strong? Uh, you know, is there a lot of gossip going on in the group? Uh, you know, and so they, they worry about if a small group goes, goes bad, then it can be bad for the church. It could cause a split in the church or, or something like that. So I think that's a big issue for a lot, of, a lot of church leaders is just how do I control it? How do I know if people are, are growing spiritually if they're in a small group and not in a big group at the church? So how do I know if they're taking their next steps? So that's a couple of the biggest issues that I see, consistency, and then are they, are they uh, fulfilling the mission that we, we want them to fulfill? Great, great. great. And there, I mean, there, there are many churches that are, uh, across the UK and you know, in the US as well that will be running you know, midweek Bible studies or they'll be running small groups. But I think one of the things that I reckon is that most churches don't know why they run small groups. Um, why do you think small groups are so important in the life of a church? Yeah, I, small groups are essential to me to the life of the church. I mean, if we look at the early church in you know Acts in Acts chapter two, you can see the the life of the church was lived out from house to house. So you know it says house to house. Uh, they met in the temple, but they started out house to house, and in that. You know, so I think that that smaller gathering of people is, am I frozen? No, no, you're still that. Carry on. Chris, you're still there if, if, uh, if you can hear us. So I'll pick up on that, Chris, that when we're looking at the, yeah, go for it. the, the why about why we do something, this is one of the reasons that we've seen in churches round about that this isn't just about getting to an outcome and copying what somebody does. We're looking at underlying processes and reasons. Um, so we're looking at what led people to that understanding that this was nece necessary for them. So in churches where we're seeing uh, their small groups are experiencing some of the problems that Chris mentioned, where they might go off topic or where they don't really tie into the actual life of the overall organization. It's because they've tried to duplicate a model that they've seen happen elsewhere without actually going back into the, into the, the why we're doing it and applying the correct process. Uh, so we, we, we have, we have Chris back in. I'm so sorry. I'm, I switched to my phone. This should work. Hi, Chris. Welcome back. Welcome back. Um, you were talking about, um, the kind of why behind uh, small groups, and um, we yeah. we lost you about about there. Um, pick up from from where you from where you started, and it'd be great to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I, I groups are essential to the life of a church. I mean, if we look at the early church, if we look at Acts chapter two, it clearly lays out that they met house to house. Um, they also gathered in the temple, but they obviously met in small groups. And I think the reason for that is that, you know, we are built for community. Um, you know, we, we can get all the knowledge that, that we can get when we have those temple times, when we, we have those times together. But if we're not living it out uh, with, you know, a group of believers, then how are we being discipled? How are we growing in our life with Christ? And so I think that a small group of people uh, living life together is the only way we're really going to understand the gospel. I mean, it's the only way that, you know, we, we can get the knowledge, but the only way we're going to live it out is if we have people walking beside us, alongside us, um, pushing us, um, pulling us along. And that's what a small group does for me. I mean, if I look back through the years, you know, my, my accountability partners, my best friends, people that have uh, cheered me on through life have come from my small groups. Um, so I just, you know, I think that if we don't have some type of small group system, and that can look different for different churches, that can be, you know, more of a Sunday school model on Sunday morning, or it can be in houses, but some place that we have where we're sitting down with eight to 12 other believers and saying, this is my life, this is what's going on, um, then I think we're missing out a huge, on a huge part of what the church is designed to be. Great, great. And I think when we think about small groups, there's been so many different models and types of doing uh, small groups. And there's so many different types of small groups. There are some, you know, there are evangelistic style small groups where they're focused on, you know, they gather just for evangelistic purposes. There's 
uh, ones which are more sort of pastoral care ones. Some of them are kind of a, a, a mix of all of them. I think the, uh, one of the issues that church leaders and, you know, if you're leading a small group ministry, you might have is thinking, right, how do I position this? Where does this fit in terms of how we're discipling uh, our congregation? And, and I think probably the worry is they feel like they've got to do everything. Um, yeah. How can church leaders think about how they position their small groups? Yeah, I, I think it's a big mistake that we make with small groups is if we want them to uh, fulfill everything in our church. And another mistake is on the other side of it, when it's just one part of a, a list of programs or ministries. If it's a on a menu list of, of ministries or offerings, small groups are going to lose almost every single time because it's just more difficult to uh, be in a small group. There's more accountability that has to happen when you're in a small group. And so people are going to opt for the easier options, you know, the midweek Bible study, just the bigger environments, men's ministry, women's ministry, they're just going to go for those instead of small groups. And so if we're just offering them as a subset of several ministries, they're not going to accomplish what we want them to accomplish. And on the other flip side is if we expect them to do everything for us, then I think we're also going to be disappointed um, uh, with, with our small groups. And so we have to figure out what is our path for people to grow as, as, as Christians. So how do we get them from step A to step B to be closer, to be more like Jesus? And then where, where do small groups fit in that pathway? And so uh, what we need to think is what is the outcome? So we want a fully devoted follower of Christ, a disciple of Christ. So we, we figure out what does that look like? So let's back off from that. So how do we get there? How do we help people achieve, you know, kind of to go down that pathway? And where do small groups fit on that pathway? And so once we do that, then we can decide, okay, what kind of outcomes do we need from our a small group to help people become disciples? Mm -hmm. And so once you start doing that, then you can figure out in the life of your if you're ministering the life of your church, where can small groups fit in the best? How can, how can we get people plugged in? Where can we get them plugged in? And then what are the results that we expect from our small groups? And I think, you know, one of, one of the big issues that we have is we don't know what our small groups should be producing. We don't know what the expectations are. So let's go into it. Let's figure that out. And then let's place them on the pathway where they need to be when it comes to discipleship at our church. Great, great. Um, I'd love to just talk a little bit about your your latest book, uh, Leading Small Groups. Um, you, uh, your book has kind of four steps for uh, a successful small group, which is about sort of gathering the group, launching the group, leading the group, and multi multiplying the group. Could you just sort of tell us, give us a sort of a quick overview about those those steps and why you think they're important? Sure. Yeah. Um, I think each step matters. Uh, to the life of a group, if it's going to be a successful group, each step has to be thought about. Um, the first step, which is gathering, uh, a lot of groups never get off of the ground because they don't know how to get started. They don't know who to invite. They don't know, um, you know, how, how to get that word, the word out about their small group. And so I spent the first section of the book, one, talking about what is a small group? Why should we have a small group? What is a biblical community? But then how do we begin to gather that community together? And we can look at the life of Jesus as a great example of how to gather a community. And if you look at Jesus, he didn't just look at the people uh, that were just like him, that, that thought like him, that believed like him. He, he brought people into his community, into his group that were very different, but that he came about in his regular life. So looking at those people, our neighbors, the people that we work with, that we wouldn't necessarily think, now that's the first person I would invite to a small group, mm -hmm. but they may be the person that that need to be in our, you know, that needs to be in our small group that we have some influence with. So who do we invite? How do we make that invite? You know, um, uh, what's, what's, you know, what, what are the plans for the group? Having kind of the vision mission statement for the group. So having all that in place so that we can gather a group together. And then the next step is launching the group. How do we launch successfully? So people want to come back because the goal of a group would be, we want people to come back to the second meeting. If they only come to the first one, it's not a very successful small group. So how do we launch well 
you know, what are some things that we need to have in place? We need to have you know, curriculum, uh, a good study in place. Uh, what does the environment look like that we're going to be uh, leading our group in? Are people comfortable? Is it a place that people want to go? Do they naturally know where that is? Is it kind of centered uh, where the people live that we're inviting them to our group? So it's just launching it well so we can continue on past those first couple of meetings. And then, you know, the, the next step is how do we lead a group? Um, you know, how, how do we uh, facilitate a conversation around a Bible study? How do we um, you know, choose a Bible study? Uh, how do we deal with difficult people that are going to be in our group? Because every group is going to have what I call EGRs, which stands for Extra Grace Required. And I tell most group leaders, if they don't know who EGR in their group is, it's probably them. So it's just knowing, you know, how, how do we how do we deal with people like that? How do we pastor people in our group? Because if we're if you're a small group leader, you are shepherding a portion of your church. And so you need to know how do I do that? How do I pastor them? How do I help people take their next steps? So how do I lead well as a small group leader? And then the fourth step is a step that I think most groups don't get to because it's the most difficult one. But if we're going to live out 2 Timothy 2.2 2, and create generations of disciples, the only way that we're going to do that is if we multiply what we're doing through our small group. And so how do we set our group up from the beginning to be able to multiply, to create generations of disciples? And that doesn't mean, you know, I hear a lot of negative things about multiplication that we're going to split our group. I don't like the word split. All it means to me is that we are raising up leaders we are discipling people so they want to step out and they want to disciple other people and so we just create those generations of disciples and if your small groups are created hopefully to create disciples then you want them to multiply you want more small groups to happen out of those groups and so if a group can start with the multiplication mindset and then by the time they get there it's just a natural part of the life of the group then it's going it's it's going to be so much easier to mm. start other groups I oh, know that that's great. Um, I just, I'd love to pick up on the um, the bit around sort of gathering a group because I think one of the biggest factors that I think church leaders will come up against is how do you get a, a group to gel together and you know how how do you know that you've got the right people in in the room? Uh, so what what sort of strategies have you found successful in creating that uh, that environment that develops relationship and, and community? Yeah. Uh, one part of it is it takes time. It takes time for groups to gel. Um, you know, we, we want our small groups to immediately bond, to create these friendships, to go deeper in their relationships. And that's just not going to happen probably for about uh, most groups, about five to six months before they can begin to start kind of gelling as a community. I, I call it refrigerator rights. So, you know, when the group gets to where they come over to our house and they don't have to ask before they open the refrigerator, they can just go and open it and get some water out or whatever they need. That's refrigerator rights. And to me, when you get to that point, that means that you're starting to build some community. You're starting to gel as a group. And so I think it's important for church leaders and small group leaders to understand that it's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen immediately. It's going to take some time. And again, that goes back to that consistency part we, we, we got to stay consistent we got to meet consistently um, you know there's going to be nights when you're going to have more there's going to be nights you're going to have less there's going to be times that you're going to be tempted to cancel group because you know a few people couldn't make it and i just want to encourage the group leaders to as much as you can to stay faithful with your consistently meeting because that's the only way that you're going to get to that that gelling part that community part so i think that is really important. I think another aspect is understanding the levels of uh, community that you're going to achieve when it comes to a small group. I think a lot of leaders get into leading a group and they think that they're going to get to this deep intimate relationship with each person in the group and that they are a failure if they don't get there. And that was kind of my viewpoint when I started leading groups and it was hard for me when I just didn't have that relationship. And what I want to encourage you with is that you're not supposed to have that relationship with every single person in your group. It's just, it's not natural. It's not healthy for you to have that deep, intimate relationship. 
your goal as a small group leader is to help people in your group find those relationships with other people in the group. So recognizing the people in your group that just have natural, uh, you know, hobbies or stage mm-hmm. of life with somebody else in the group, helping them make those connections. And, and they're going to be able to make those on their own. And as long as you're kind of facilitating those relationships, that's a successful um, leadership uh, move in a group. And so, you know, I, I look at there's four levels of belonging I got from Joseph Myers. But uh, the w- first one is kind of that surface. We all know each other because we go to the same church. The second one is a little bit deeper. We are all now in the same group. So we're hearing each other's lives a little bit, a little bit more. The third one is kind of that two or three people that get together outside of group because we have common interests and, you know, we get to know each other a little bit more. Uh, Over here in the States, we call them D groups. A lot of times those discipleship intensive groups. And then there's that kind of fourth deepest, that intimate uh, relationship for, you know, for married people, most of the time that's our spouse. Um, But for a lot of people, that's a mentor maybe, but that's one person that knows pretty much everything about you. And so as you look at your groups, are those groups making those bonds? They're gonna start at that that larger group level where we all attend the same church or maybe we all live in the same neighborhood, but how are they kind of making those deeper relationships and is the leader helping facilitate kind of those relationships within the group? So it, it takes time and then it takes intentionality to know are people getting connected within the group and how can I help facilitate that as a leader? Great stuff. Yeah. Um, I'd love to pick up on about content. Sorry, Lee, were you going to, were you jumping in? Yeah, there? I was thinking, linking on to the content question that I think you're, that you're coming to is, is um, how we get that balance between helping people manage relationships and show them that kind of, uh, looking out for one another and for one another and what that might look like as a balance with any level of content that we put in that links to the thematic aspect of what we might be teaching. Some of our churches teach wholly thematic programs and it's very, very broad, very invitational, very open. Others of the churches we work with, you get much more theological stances on Sunday morning and the teaching is very much around individual Bible verses. So yeah. So, so Chris, just back to your, back, back to the content question is, Kind of like, yeah, how we well, yeah. Put those two in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess when we're thinking about content, um, Chris, what's the kind of, um, what's the thinking that you use to sort of shape how, what kind of content that you use? Um, what is it that you're looking for? And how do you go about creating that, that's something that's compelling that people want to engage with? Um, what, what's your thinking behind that? Yeah, um, I think, when it comes to content, uh, you need a plan. Um, a lot of times as church leaders, we'll kind of leave it up to the groups, um, you know, whatever you want to study or uh, just follow along with the, the church uh, messages or, or something like that. And it, it, it doesn't take groups to wherever they need to be because most groups will have a natural inclination when it comes to what they want to study. Um, for a lot of groups, they'll stay in more of a kind of a community mode. We're gonna do studies that more, you know, they're about friendships and they're about, um, you know, uh, life stages and things like that, and that's okay. But if you just kind of stay in that, then your group is not gonna grow. Your people are not gonna grow. They're just gonna stay in this kind of comfort zone when it comes to the conversations. And also when groups, if they're just talking about Um, You know, if they're just doing message-based studies, let's say, so studies just based on the messages, and and I think that's great. My groups over the years have done a lot of message-based studies, but they'll get in a rut of kind of talking about the same things over and over, because most churches will kind of recycle their series or their content. They'll do maybe a year's worth, and then they'll kind of repeat it, and they'll do a different type of series or something like that, but we, you end up having the same conversations around the same topics and a group can become stale easily when that happens it can become toxic when that happens especially if new people aren't brought into the group at some point and so you just end up kind of having these circle conversations and so what i encourage groups to do and churches to do is to have some type of a uh, discipleship plan when it comes to your content so take a look at again back to the conversation of 
what is a disciple? So if we know the outcome of what we want our groups to produce, so this is a disciple. Um, these, this is what a, a, a disciple exudes. So this is how they live their life. This is how they are like Jesus. So how do we help them get there? And a good way to do that is by being intentional with the content that we ask our groups to go through. So not just leaving them in those comfort zones. Um, a good example of this is Lifeway uh, several years ago did a, a, a big study. It was like over 4,000 churches across three or four different countries. And uh, they just asked, what are the signs of a disciple? So in your church, in your context, what are, what are the fruits that you're seeing from the people who are discipled in your church? And so out of that, they came up with uh, eight essentials um, or characteristics of a disciple. And, um, and then they put that into a discipleship path. So if you want your people to grow and to, and to have these signposts or these signs of a disciple, then we want them to go through content that helps them get there. And so, you know, laying out your content and say, okay, the first one is a disciple, you know, uh, reads the word on a regular basis. They're, they're in their Bible on a regular basis, which research has shown that if they do that, they're more likely to do the other things down the road. They're more likely to serve. They're more likely to give. Um, they're more likely to uh, share their faith with others. Um, so if we start there, then we want a group to talk about what does it look like to study God's word? You know, how do, how do we exegete? The, the word so people can understand it and how do you know how do we read it on a daily basis and fall in love with God's word so we want content for that okay so we want content to help people to um, to know how to serve uh, you know that's a, that's a pain point for a lot of churches is our groups don't serve or our people don't serve so how do we find content or write content that's going to help people um, you know, discover that in themselves and then how do we uh, help them to be able to give of their resources and how do we help them to be able to share their faith and on down the line so but knowing uh, what are the steps what are the signs of what you want to see from a disciple and then let's let's get content trustworthy content uh, whether we write it ourselves or we, we buy it from places like Lifeway or somewhere like that but trustworthy content that that people can walk their groups through in a conversational way it doesn't have too much you know churchies in it uh, too much christianese that's conversational that doesn't have too much homework you know things like that because people's lives are busy but let's find some content that helps them uh, follow that discipleship path that we've, we've set out, that we say, this is what a fully devoted follower of Christ looks like. Now let's help you get that by uh, giving you good content. Right. Great. Great. Great stuff. Okay. So um, at the moment we're in, uh, we're in lockdown uh, and some, uh, I mean, we've already looked last week at sort of the technology around, how you can run small groups so um we, what, what we won't do is get into the kind of the technology side of it because that you know we're on zoom at the moment there's great technology that's around but um what i wanted to get into is when we're thinking about small groups uh and online uh, how does the dynamic change with creating um like uh, creating community and creating that sense of uh you know sharing lives together when we're having to do things remotely yeah i mean i think it's an interesting time um for the life of the church you know if you look back through history the church has um has prospered when it's been persecuted or gone through crisis or tribulation or, or trouble and so i think we're in one of those periods right now where we are having to adjust as a you know big c church and it's, I think it's driving us back to um, the beginnings. I think, you know, when, when we talk about that house to house, man, Chris, that we are literally living that right now. Um, you know, we've been in a, in America for a few weeks already, and you guys are just starting to, to realize it. But, you know, we're being forced to stay in our houses. We're being forced to gather with smaller gatherings of people. And I think it's forcing us as a church to think, okay, how do we how do we prosper in these times? How do we help people grow when they can't meet in the temple, but they're meeting house to house? Um, and you know, Zoom and Google Hangouts is just another version of house to house. I mean, if you see, you know, the the screenshots of small groups that are meeting 
um, together in a Zoom room, and they're, they're, they're living out the gospel in a, a small environment together. But having said that, it is a different dynamic than if you're sitting in a living room together. Um, it's already hard enough to get a conversation going when you're sitting in the room with eight to 10 to people. It's a little bit, it's actually, it's a lot harder when you're, you're on a, a conference call. You know, if you work at a business, you've probably done a conference call at some point. And sometimes it can be awkward. Sometimes it can be, you know, uh, just weird to be honest with you. So there are some things that I think we can do uh, as we have our groups online to help that out. Um, one of the, there's our social cues that we have to pay attention to when we're together in person, but we really have to pay attention to when we're online. So, uh, you know, the important thing as a moderator, as a host, is that I am very engaged in the conversation. If the host is checking out or if they're multitasking during the conversation, then the group is not going to be engaged. And so they have to be very engaging, very into the conversation. Um, you know, with the, when it comes to the technology, just being able to see everyone, you know, all of that is important. Um, having the quietest room that you can possibly have in the house. And these are basic things we think about with groups anyway. You know, when people come over to our house, we put our dog in a room downstairs so it's not going to bother anybody or anybody who's allergic to pets or anything like that. Well, the same thing, if you've got a lot of distractions going on in the room around you while you're on camera, it's going to distract people that are, that are online. So you want to make sure you have that. Um, you know, and then some of those basic social cues of muting your mic uh, that you don't have to pay attention to when you're in a room together. Uh, you know, some of those things you need to run over at the front, some of those just basic rules of if you want to talk, uh, maybe raise your hand um, before you talk, but make sure, make sure you have your mics muted when you're not uh, being talked to. And then it's also important for the host moderator to not dominate the conversation. And it's really easy to do that when you're having an online gathering instead of in person. You know, in one of the roles I always talk about with uh, group leaders anyway, when they're having a small group, is only talk about 30% of the time, 30 to 40% of the time. Let the group take the rest of it, because if you dominate, there's not going to be enough room for people to talk and give their opinions. Well, it's especially true when it comes to an online gathering, because the silence that happens online is even worse than the silence that happens in a group, uh, when, in a physical meeting, because it's just, what are you doing? You know, people are just sitting there staring at their screens. But the only way you're going to get conversation going is if you mute your mic and allow other people to talk. And eventually somebody's going to do it because it's going to hurt somebody to not talk. You're going to have that uh, eight on the Enneagram in your group that just has to fill the space. And so once they figure out the technology part of it, which is going to take some time and that's okay, um, then, then let that happen. And, uh, but just let other people talk. You might have to call on people a little bit more. I might say, hey, Lee, you know, we haven't heard from you in a little bit. You know, do you have an opinion on this? You know, something like that. So you may have to be a little bit more directive when it comes to your leading than you would in a house. But, uh, but let other people talk. And also um, have a plan for people when they want to talk. So uh, utilizing the chat feature is great as well. You know, Zoom has a chat feature. I'm pretty sure like Google Hangouts has a chat feature. So having that for kind of those, I have a thought on this, but I don't want to bring it up right now. Maybe we can come back to it. Something like that is, is important. So just having a plan for that, giving your full attention to the group, having I. Uh, contact. You know, I've done the Zoom meetings for a long time, and you can tell when somebody is not really paying attention. I mean, they start kind of drifting off, and so staying, you know, with the with the uh, with the uh, camera, saying looking into the screen, and you know that's important in an online group meeting. And then probably the biggest uh, part of this is staying in contact after the group meeting. Because what's going to happen, you know, as you kind of go through this is that people are going to really start to feel isolated and lonely, uh, especially when you can't get out. Um, where I live, we're on complete lockdown. So the only thing that we're supposed to do is go to the grocery store if we need to. Uh, we can't go to our jobs. And so it's easy to start feeling like you're the only person, you're isolated. And so it's really important during these times that during the week, 
keep in contact, whether that's, you know, phone call. I think phone calls are, are, are so important now. Actually talking to a person is just a huge deal during this time. Um, or it's through texting, you know, using WhatsApp or uh, GroupMe or something. That's how our group communicates is almost daily. We're on GroupMe kind of saying, here's what I'm going through. Here's the issues for today. But just staying connected um, outside of that group time is important because just because we're not meeting physically doesn't mean we should, you know, we should be in isolation from each other. Um, so you need to be more intentional when it comes to that if you're meeting only online. Yeah, I, I think it's one of those things that we've, we've called it social distancing. In reality, it's, it's, it's physical distancing. And actually, we need to be more, more sociable than ever. And, um, you know, those, those, call, those video calls that you get from your friends, they, you know, and, and that we give to our friends, you know, they are, they're life-giving for people. I think that's, that's so true. Um, Chris, I was wondering... Um, how can we so at one point all of this will hopefully be over at some point soon but i think um we can still leverage online small groups how do you what sort of ways do you think that we can do that once coronavirus is gone that the online small groups can still have a place in our church yeah I, again i think that this is changing the way we think about church um i i, I have a feeling that i mean things will go back to more normal we should gather together you know we're called in uh you know hebrews 10 that do don't forsake the gathering of the saints so i think that is still going to be an important part of what we do but i think that this forced isolation is going to bring uh, new ideas and fresh ways for us to connect people who wouldn't necessarily jump in at that temple temple part that wouldn't jump into our church and so I think having some type of an offering where people can get connected virtually before you know getting connected physically is something that we should think about going on with continuing with mm. I mean I know of churches that have actually been doing online community online groups for a long time and being pretty successful with it there's a church in the states called Saddleback Church pastored by Rick Warren and they before any of this hit they had thousands of online small groups of people who gathered virtually um, before they gathered physically. Now, ha having said that, the goal should be that we want to help people take their next steps. And the best way for them to take their next steps is, um, you know, with a group of people physically that they can be held accountable to, you know, all of those things. So we want to help people go from A to B. But what if A now is online and not necessarily at our church what if our sunday morning um, online stream is more intentional and we encourage more people to gather there and then we have ways for them to gather into groups straight mm -hmm. out of that and so we continue offering you know online options for people who attend our online service that they can jump into get connected to and then the host of those, you know, their goal is to eventually get them connected locally to, you know, if they don't live in your town or your city, get them connected locally to a church in their city or get them connected eventually to your, your uh, physical church, but not having to rush that. So we yeah. know that we can, we can do community online. We can do Bible study online. We can do all of these things. So let's use it as a tool to spread the gospel like we never could before. And so I think we would make a mistake if at the end of this, we just said, okay, we're, we're, we're now all going back to normal. We're all going to be gathering physically. You know, we're going to drop all of this online stuff. I think we would be missing a huge evangelistic piece that we have been forced to uh, discover or rediscover through this crisis. Yeah, I think I'd, I'd add on that. You, you mentioned um, apps like GroupMe and WhatsApp that a lot of people in the church environment, if we've been in church for a very long time, and that's the one of the only contexts that we know our connections are in that environment but actually it's working the other way as well we're now in whatsapp groups with people on our street that we haven't spoken to you know as as recently to look at how we look after you know when 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 the when the bins are being collected what did we know about schools is there anybody on our street that's vulnerable that needs a you know something dropping off making sure you know so some of those communities are springing up aside from the church community but actually i've got an opportunity now where if i'm engaging somebody in the again they see that you're normal 
you've actually got a reach to have an invite. So follow with that evangelistic piece, saying to somebody, hey, if you like this environment, you like what we're doing, a few of us get together and actually that, that sense of, you know, we're, we're talking about things, we're talking about any anxieties we've got at this time, we're looking at the hope that we actually feel still through all of this. We, there's an opportunity to invite people kind of like across in those digital spaces as well. So I think we need to make sure we don't forget that the, the online communities, are, they're not as distinct as we sometimes make with the physical communities. If I sit next to people in a work office every day, but if I'm chatting to somebody and similarly every day on, on, on an online community that's actually listening and hearing and attending the needs of my community, what a great space to interject as the church and to actually see if there's anything we can add. But also the church response now is different. We're not getting them into that Sunday morning experience kind of like steps. We're, we're, we're reaching direct to where people are at. What we're, we're, what we're listening to we're, we're they're actually going to be heard which actually for a lot of people is the fact that they've spoken before and they've not been heard and that's really important in these environments that actually there's so much more now picked up on when it slows down to wait turns and actually listen that we can pick up on those cues so i, th I think there's a lot to be said for how the invite process will go and inviting people into other online environments and digital environments will be will be essential as part of this yeah i'm hearing yeah. from the churches that i track with their sunday morning numbers or their online service are huge i mean they're having uh, so much bigger numbers now that they've gone online than they were physically and i think because it's just an easier first step so it's easier to say hey check my church out here's a link you just have to log in same thing with the group you know it's a lot easier invite invite to say hey just click on this link join us on Tuesday night at seven, then here's my address, come over, you know, so I think, you know, we're going to see some of that uh, kind of flow into the next season, even when it goes back to more normal. Yeah, that's, um, that's amazing to think about the possibilities that online holds, especially because, you know, inviting someone to a house or being invited to someone's house is a very personal, it's a very personal thing. And I think to say, actually, you can join us online if you want to. You just hang out with us for a bit, talk with us for a bit. I think that online has a lot of advantages in that sense, in terms of an, uh, in terms of us inviting our our friends to church. I think that there's because it's so much easier just to send a link, isn't it, and to say, hey, why don't you check this out? You don't have to, you know, you don't have to feel put out by this. You don't have to feel like this is odd or weird. You just you can you can observe. You have you have those kind of rights. To be able to do that is uh, but also we can help draw people into some kind of community that's that's really meaningful as well yep yep i agree great so um a question i've been wanting to ask you um is uh one day in the future hopefully we'll all be out of lockdown and uh we'll all be able to you know meet in person again hopefully and we'll be starting to think about okay how are we going to how are we going to do groups in in person again um in the uk um our houses are a lot smaller than than yours in the us on average so for instance uh the average living room in the uk is 172 square feet which is um 16 square meters whereas in the us it's 330 square feet which is 30 square meters so it's, it's just under double the size of an average living room in the us um so my living room would be a good size in you know for the uk but i can only seat 10 people and that's that's pretty generous um whereas i've been in some living rooms in the us where you could seat double that for sure um so um i'm sure there'll be a question that many people watching this will be thinking okay how does how does it work well when you've got confined spaces because we all know that you can get a great atmosphere when you've got a lot of people and you have that buzz but how do you great get it when it's a lot smaller and you've got to work work in confined spaces yeah i think it's a great question i love having those stats i think that's that's fascinating to me we actually where i live we live in uh, downtown nashville and it's a small kind of a uh, lot smaller house than we've ever lived in before and we have one of those small living rooms i mean we could comfortably sit maybe 10 maybe 10 and our groups tend to run from about 10 to 12 um uh, on a on a weekly basis and for me honestly 
the smaller the group, the better the conversation. Um, you know, we tend to think more successful, larger. You know, if we can get 20 people in our group, that, hey, we're successful, we're getting a lot of people in our group. When I, the larger groups tend to stay more on the surface when it comes to their conversation because it's, it's harder to get voices heard. Um, you know, if it's a couples group, what you'll tend to see is that one of, uh, of a couple will talk more than the other. And, and so they'll kind of speak as a unit instead of both people talking. And so I'm actually not a big fan of the larger group when it comes to the deeper conversations. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with having a bigger group, but I always encourage, even if you can comfortably see, you know, 20 people in your living room, subdivide and have two groups of 10, maybe go one go to the kitchen, one stay in the living room, and you're gonna have a much better conversation that way. And so I think as you're thinking about space, um, you know, whatever can comfortably sit in your living room, probably invite about a half more than that to your group because you're not gonna get everyone every single week. It's just not usually gonna happen, but be okay. If you can only comfortably sit eight, then invite 12 people to be a part of your group. You'll normally get about six to eight and you'll have good conversations. Um, so I really space for me is not a big issue. I think you have to have the right expectations for what your group is going to be. Um, you know, if we can comfortably sit eight and we can get six to eight every week, then that's successful. That's a great group. Now on the flip side, if uh, you can only get one or two in your group, it's going to be hard to be consistent because if you have one person miss, then you're down to one person in your group. Um, so, you know, if you can get a little bit of momentum with at least three or four people and, um, you know, going, I think that's, that's a great group. So I like the smaller groups. I actually like the nights with our group. Our, our group would have kind of total, if everyone showed up, about 16, maybe 18. And I like the nights when we have eight, because I feel like that's the best conversations that we have. And so what that's going to force churches to do is to have more groups. And so think in, you know, we, we have an average space that can fit 10 people. So we're going to need, if we have 100 people in our adults in our church, we're going to need at least 10 groups, you know, for people to be a part of. So it's just kind of uh, uh, thinking through the, the stats and the number of people that you have, and then how many groups do we need to get everybody in a group? You're just going to need more groups. But I'm, yeah, I'm, I wouldn't worry about a, a smaller space. I think that makes for a better conversation anyway. Fantastic Great stuff. Great. Um, Lee, um, obviously we're we're both part of Thinking Church, and uh, we're here to sort of help churches plan their church well. Um, so could you just tell us about a few things that we've got that would help churches that are trying to think through, okay, how do you do small groups and how, how am I going to think through these kind of things? What sort of things do we have that might be of benefit to some, some churches? I think, I think first off, it comes back to, we actually have facilitator experience, that thing of being able to host and, uh, and guide and apply process. And that the principles of that hold whether we are meeting in a virtual environment like this or if we're meeting physically and coming to your church to to work with you so actually for us this is a time when you've got dispersed teams maybe some of their day-to-day -day workload has stopped maybe some of what you were planning and what you were building towards there's a lot of people with easter services that have not got you know that the manpower is all of a sudden freed up but now you're having to look at things differently why not use that time really wisely um, and you know, invest into the life of your church and look at taking uh, uh, some, some input that would facilitate you virtually as a team that we can um, apply all of our processes and help you map some of this out and uh, guide you to an outcome that is unique to you. We are not consultancy, we are facilitators. Um, and by that we mean we're not coming to apply some cookie cutter template to tell you this is the way the last church we worked with did it, this is how it applies to you. We want to get the best resource and the best input, apply great process, you bring the content and together we'll get a great result. So we've got online packages available. We've done online facilitation before. It's just that we're in a, in a time now where everybody's throwing virtual before anything that they offer. And um, this is something we have experience of. We've worked in these environments um, to cut down 
travel and to make it appropriate and to work with teams who are often dispersed, especially with boards and trustees and people who have workload that might take them further afield. Um, in fact, we've recently worked with a church team who they had some were present in the room and some were online. So we can even do them in hybrid environments as well, if that, if that would suit you. But check out our website, find us on social media, have a look at what we're offering. And if there's something that can help your church through this time, then please get in touch because we would love to serve you, love to come alongside and help identify that thing that is unique for your church in this time, in these environments, and to help you achieve that to the best of our ability. Um, and that is by applying process, you bring the content, and then we will get to that great result. Yeah, that, that's right. Absolutely. Um, Lee, we've also got, um, we have a custom package as well, where you can kind of mix and match what you want. Can you just, just give us a little overview about what that is involved with? Yeah. So maybe we're, uh, maybe we're having to look right back at the beginning. Maybe this is understanding where are we now, how we got to now. That's an important stage in all this, the assessment element of what we're doing. Maybe, maybe, maybe even like, so we do virtual, sh uh, we do uh, secret shopper for Sunday services at church. Much easier to do virtual secret shopping and just attend your online services as well and help you have a look at maybe what you're doing and how we could help and what things you could perhaps tweak. But if you're looking at defining success, um, if you're looking at moving to a planning phase, um, if we're going to move through to structure and having a look at what you need to take you forward and then how to move to action. Most people have no difficulty in looking and identifying the problems that they, uh, that they are undergoing or maybe why they're stuck at this present point in time. But actually moving to action is one of the trickiest pieces. Actually helping churches move to, um, to execute is, is more difficult. So we have bespoke packages. Grab a call with us. Talk through what you're um, experiencing. We'd love to spend some time with you and help understand maybe what's happening for you in, in context. Maybe you're looking at succession planning. Maybe you're looking at that transition in leadership. Maybe you're trying to even identify, as Chris was talking earlier, about what, what is a disciple? What are the hallmarks? What are the things that we're going to address? How do we define that level of success? And maybe, maybe this is just, we don't even know where to start online and how to market ourselves. It's a word that sometimes we don't like to say. We need to market. It just means telling people about what we do, which means a great story. Maybe now's the time to look at switching our language from being insider focused to, speak, to speaking to those who are external and those in our communities who we've all of a sudden um, got a lot more in common with that we're finding that we're closer to and maybe contacting in these virtual environments. Now's the time to work out how we can reach them. And then whether it's planning your content, looking at strategy or how to uh, get health into your organization. And we will always come at this from a health first approach. It's about being healthy, not about numbers and growth particularly. That will come. They, they can be byproducts of it. This is about making sure you have the health and that we can sustain it and that everything that you've got is in place to give you the greatest chance of success. Um, and so that's, if you're looking at building something up and you're not quite sure where to start, have a chat to us and we can build packages and uh, we're, we're just ready to put things together to help sure help make sure that you've got the, uh, uh, the, the best of everything to move, move your church um, uh, on into uh, great health. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And um, it, you picked up on the um, looking at discipleship, but I think especially if there are churches are going, right, how are we going to work out how we're going to do our small groups? Uh, we do a whole workshop on building a discipleship pathway. So you're working out, okay, what does a mature disciple of, of Christ look like and then how can we build the steps in to do that and then how can yeah. we build our programs around a pathway rather than just offering everything and not knowing what any one program what it's there to do its purpose I think that there sets the real framework where you know when you're thinking Absolutely. about groups when you've got that framework in place you can really start thinking okay we now know what these groups are there to achieve just like just like Chris was saying uh, earlier on it yeah. yeah and I think and adding on to that as well um, if people are going to be leading groups helping them understand what the what the agreements are and the expectations of them make sure things are documented do you have volunteer agreements in place that articulate the expectations and what you would expect to be happening on any of those situations and also if those people are out there and they're running these groups and they are leading what does your leadership pipeline look like as well? And how do we make sure that we're, we're tracking with them to ensure that they are equipped 
and that them as leaders are given the best chance of um, success. So how do we define what that looks like too? So alongside the discipleship pathway, there is leadership pathway and development and what that looks like in your church um, and how that might apply. So it's another thing that we'd, we'd love to speak to you about. So if you need any of that information, uh, Chris has the details in a minute, uh, but you know, find us. And we'll be pointing to some more of the resources from uh, Chris Surratt as well. And some of the recent podcasts he's been putting out that dive into some of this in more detail. Uh, but also allows you to listen at other times and maybe share it. And this will also be going up on our YouTube channel. So it's available to watch later if you want to share it with anybody. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, if you'd like to discuss anything uh, with us, just please drop us an email. Uh, our email address is hello at thinking.church. Uh, and if you'd like to talk uh, more in depth uh, with us, uh, we offer a free one hour uh, consultation. It's a video call just, just like this. Uh, and you can go to www thinking.church and if you click the uh, the buy now button it will take you through to our booking page and you can book a one hour slot there there's a number of slots available uh, it's really really easy to do that uh chris thank you so much it was an absolute yeah. honor to have you with us today thank you so much for giving up your time and uh yeah we absolutely loved it brilliant stuff thank you so much thank you i loved it guys thanks for having me thank you great lee thank you uh thank you once again yeah and uh, Chris, what have we got coming up in our next webinar? Well, um, so next week we'll be running another free webinar. So it's, but it's, we'll be doing it on Thursday the 2nd uh, this time, Thursday the 2nd of April at 3 p.m. Uh, we'll be talking with Lee Baker. Uh, now, Lee is the lead worship pastor at uh, 12 Stone Church in Atlanta. Uh, so if you don't know 12 Stone Church, uh, they are a multi-site church. Uh, they've got about 16,000 people across eight locations. And Lee has also uh, launched something called Meta, which is a whole online uh, worship training resource. It is amazing. Uh, so we will be talking with Lee just about running worship teams during lockdown and online, but also looking about how you can run a worship team in a multi-site setting too. There's so many more churches in the UK that are starting to look at multi-site and the, the piece around how do you think about your worship on that side of things is a really really big conversation and it can actually get uh, pretty bad if you don't think it through beforehand so um, Lee has got some amazing insights uh, on that so um, invite your worship teams to join us on that day and pastors to join us it will give you such great insight on thinking if you're thinking about going multi-site it'll be perfect for you uh, to hear that as well. Brilliant. Well, I think that is, that's all. Um, that's all for me. Thank you everyone who's uh, joined in. We'll be, as Lee said, we'll put this up on uh, online on YouTube so that you can see it. It's uh, always on to help uh, the local church. Uh, which is what we're passionate about. And uh, thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye.